Okay, welcome back. The afternoon session is about to start. Aaron is working on uh, the APL compiler, and that's what he's going to show us today. Enjoy. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you all hear me in the back if I talk about this level? Is that all right? Or would you like it more? Louder? All right. I'll see how long my voice lasts at this level. Um, I might have to go to the mic, but we'll, we'll see. So, yes, I have an API ELF compiler. I am not the only APL compiler writer. I think there are two more of them in existence <laughs> in the world. Um, and I will, mm, I will be talking about the compiler, but this is not primarily about the compiler. Uh, the compiler is just a showcase piece to demonstrate a broader concept. So, uh, you'll have to forgive me, I'm using you guys as a bit of an experiment because I, uh, I've given talks before and I wanted to change things up a little bit. So this is going to be a very, very interactive talk front-loaded with me throwing lots of math at you. So, um, basically what we're going to do is there's a problem in APL, the community of APL. Um, actually, there's more people here. How many are familiar with APL already? How many can write more than one line of APL code and have it work? <laughs> okay, so the problem is that a lot of people read about APL, they go, oh cool, they think they've got it, and then they can't use it worth anything. <laughs> then you've got people who see all, like uh, one of my talks that's all theory, and I'm, you know, talking about all these cool ideas and all this productivity and all this fun stuff that we're doing. And the end result is they go, you're a liar. <laughs> And they think that I'm exaggerating and that all of the stuff that I'm talking about just doesn't work in the real world. So, to head off both of those things, we're not going to start with basic easy programs. We're going to start with an industrial strength compiler that's funded and commercially available. And we're going to talk about the high level ideas by using the low level so that you can see how they connect in an actual APL program. And then we're going to reflect and play around and hopefully have a lot of fun. So that's the plan. We'll see how that goes, though. Uh, like I said, it's a bit experimental. So let's start with my preferred text editor. <laughs> yes, and so what I'm going to do for you here is I'm going to write a compiler. I'm going to write a compiler for the APL language. It's called CodeFunds. And what I would like you to do is you're not going to be able to understand what's going on here, right? Accept that now, right? That's fine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk while I'm writing the compiler, and I'm going to basically say what I see when I see this code. I'm going to translate this into the ideas, basically read the code aloud as I'm writing it for you. And I want you to reflect and focus on how I'm looking at the code that you're seeing, how I'm thinking about it, what it looks like, and so forth, okay? Any questions yet? Are we good? Yes? Can you make the font a bit larger? Ah, that's a lot. Alright. Is this a Zen Buddhism? I'm sorry? <laughs> so, our compiler is a single function. We call it TT. Okay? I'm going to, uh, the result of it. Well, actually, let's talk about the input first, right? So the input from the parser is going to be an AST combined with a set of exports and a symbol table. OK. And I happen to have a little convention that my one helper utility that I like to use is an indexing function that helps me do some things. All right, so far, so good. <laughs> now, the AST that's coming in here is what's called an inverted table in dialog APL, and you can just consider that DT, K, and N are the fields of our records inside of our AST. So a every node in our AST has a depth, a type, a kind, and a node. Now these are actually vectors in, the, uh, in this representation here, and the ordering of the nodes, which is going to be criti critical, is in depth first pre-order traversal of the AST. So now, Let's think about what the compiler passes are going to be. First, we're going to convert the depth vector into a parent vector form. Then we're going to do lambda lifting. Then we're going to wrap return expressions, because return expressions in the defunds language are implicit. We're going to wrap all of our statements with an explicit return, um, 
node, which indicates whether or not we're returning from that expression or not, or other sorts of things to do to it. Then we're going to lift complex guards for our if statements. So if our if statements have a complex test, we're going to lift that test to be executed before the if statement, and then the if statement will just work off of a single variable. <laughs> then we're going to do some uh, node mangling to edit some of the metadata in certain nodes so that we can know the, the count of certain nodes before we remove that information from the tree as we're compiling down. Then we're going to flatten our expressions or lift our expressions up. So we're going to take our complex nested expressions and turn them into single statements down in a line, sort of like you would see in assembly language. Then uh, I'm going to compute the slots and the frames. So this is our environment. So defunds is lexically scoped. So I'm going to compute the slot where every variable is given a slot to store its value in and a frame which indicates what lexical scope that variable belongs to. And then I'm going to compute the exports and anchor the variables. So we're going to do the lexical analysis to extract out, the, associate the variables with a specific frame and slot so that when the gen code generator runs, it doesn't have to do any lookup. It just has to spit out a specific frame and slot. All right, so shall we begin? <laughs> so first, we're going to create a new field R. And this new field R is going to be uh, the root node, so in other words, the, the containing function node, because every function is one-to-one uh, -one corresponds to the lexical scopes in our system. So the roots are going to be any, uh, basically, we're going to travel up the tree. For every node, we're going to walk up the tree, finding the, <coughs> finding the nodes based on our parent vector. So we're going to go, I'm going to look for, walk up the tree, and find the root node that belongs to every um, node. And every node is now associated with a specific root node that we think of. And now we're going to base our um, parent vector. To compute our parent vector, we're going to basically group all the nodes by their depth and then use that to look up your parent in the depth vector. Yes. Grouped by the delta, or, or our depth vector, assuming at the beginning that all of our nodes are top level root nodes. Okay. <laughs> Done. Now. <laughs> You'll notice I did not enable syntax highlighting. <laughs> Rainbow code is for wusses. Uh, now, now that we have the parent vector, we're going to work primarily off the parent vector. And we're going to, the parent vector converts that depth vector into basically pointers. So P for pointer or parent. Basically we have now a pointer from all of our nodes to all the other nodes based on their parent relation. And so to lift our functions, we want to take all those nested functions, lift them up into the top level so that they're, they're same. So when we lift up a function at the top level, we replace its initial occurrence with a variable referring to that top level node. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a whole new set of nodes and tack them onto the parent vector so that we basically add new vectors. And then we're going to convert the original node that was the function node into a um, variable node instead. And so to do that, we're going to basically change the end field so that all of the ends now point to our newly created, um, newly created uh, function nodes that we're, we're creating, which is of course just uh, the iota or the count more than our the lowest node in our tree. So we go by i, and we need to have i. So i is just the set of nodes that are function nodes and are not root nodes. Uh, so. Yes, and. So now that basically we've extended our parent vector and we've updated our n nodes to contain it. Now we also have to update our t, k, n, and r vectors so that they're all correct. So we're going to add some more stuff to them. So our new nodes are going to be of type 3, subkind 1, and they're going to point at nothing. And we're just going to share our original r value with them. So we duplicate the r value and we distribute that to all of our uh, nodes. And that gives us the first part of lambda lifting. Now, 
that's basically all that we need to do, except that now we need to make sure that everything is pointing correctly because we've added things and our pointers have now changed around. So we need to do some pointer recalculation so that our pointers are in the correct space. So let's recalculate the P and R vectors, which are our pointers, based on these new nodes that we've created that are in N sub I. And we're going to basically do a replacement out of those where they're based on the original theory. Um, based on the original, um, uh, basically we take iota tally p, which is our substitution vector, and then we insert the new substitutions based on n sub i, and then replace everything in p and r that references that. Now, we need to update t and k fields for our original nodes so that they're variables. And to do that, we're just going to do the replacement at the i position, and variables have type 10, 1. So now we have lifted lambdas. Who knew lambda lifting was so easy? So now we're going to wrap our expressions. So to wrap our expressions, we have to do, we have to figure out what expressions are going to be wrapped. And there are two types of things that are going to be wrapped. We have the nodes that we could wrap, which are anything that's not a guard or a function, but that whose parent, whose immediate parent is in fact a function. Or we have any of the children of the guards, or basically the, the second position of the children of the guards, which are just the nodes who are, belong to guards, like so. I'm trying to make sure I, uh, I, I kind of do this from memory, but I don't want to uh, make any mistakes, so I'm double checking myself. And so now, we need to make space to insert these new nodes that we're going to wrap around because we want to preserve the ordering. So this is, we're going to make new space and the space is going to be based off of our um, M which indicates how much space we need for each node. And we need one extra node space for anything, uh, for all of our wrapped nodes that we're going to wrap. Uh, otherwise, we only need uh, one. Basically, we don't need to add any extra space. So we have two spaces for anything that needs to be wrapped and one space for anything that doesn't need to have a new thing wrapped in it. And then, of course, at this point, we need to recalculate our pointers again because we've reorganized all of our, um, all of our mm -hmm. nodes again. So since our nodes have been reorganized, we need to do a uh, reorganization. And P, R, and I are some of them that have to get recalculated. And we're going to recalculate that using M with this well-known uh, idiom for the recalculation of indices inside of a space. And we're going to call that J because in addition to that, we have to update N because N also needs to get updated. But only some of N needs to get updated. So we need to use J again to do the updating, but we're only concerned with updating the nodes that are greater than zero in N, which correspond to the uh, reference nodes or pointer nodes. Anything below that is a symbol instead. All right, so now we have uh, recalculated our pointers. And now we need to actually do all the updates to the types. <coughs> and so T and K, which is our types, the, the type of our wrapped nodes has to get updated. So our wrapped nodes, the nodes that we're going to wrap are in I minus 1. Uh, and so we're going to update those nodes by the type is going to be an expression type, which is 2. And we're going to base the subkind on whether or not it's a binding and its parent is a function, or actually, sorry, a guard, which is, no, no, it is a function. Yeah, I'm right, yeah, function. <laughs> I'm arguing with myself here. Okay, and so the, basically our kind is going to be a negative value in the case where we have bindings, otherwise it's going to be zero. Uh, and this is how we differentiate the different types of bindings that we care about, and of course, our new parents for the old nodes that we're wrapping are just going to be the, the new nodes that we introduced. All right, so that's wrapping expressions. So let's lift guards now. So if we're going to lift the guards, the, uh, we have to basically have all of the nodes that we're going to lift, we're going to change their parent. Their parent is now going to be the root nodes that we care about. And the root nodes are going to be the parent of all of the guard nodes that we're, we need. So we need to lift them above the guard nodes, or the if statement nodes that we have. And those guard nodes are just the parent of one of 
I and J, which are the two positions that we have one armed if. So we have I, which is our test position, and J, which is our, um, our uh, thing to execute if it's true. So I is our testing position, J is the resulting computation. We're going to make sure that we have at least two of those, uh, not more, not less, and we're going to base that off of the, uh, we need the parent. Yeah, so we're going to group them by the parent and take the, yes, yes, uh, and the nodes that we're going to be computing are any nodes which are belong inside of a guard position. So that's anyone whose type is a guard. And that gives us our lifting. So now all of our guard expressions have been lifted up in the parent, but we have to do some reordering to make sure they're in the right position and all of that sort of goodness. So we're going to swap our nodes. So our guard and our test are now going to get flipped so that the, the test appears before the guard. So, so far so good. And then, after that, we um, need to make sure that the, uh, anything that was pointing to, anything that was being pointed needs to get converted. So we have to do the swap on n as well. And then we have to recompute our pointers again, because remember that we just swapped all of these things around. So the pointers actually need to get swapped around too. So we're going to make sure that we swap around our pointers. And again, using this technique from above, and now we've lifted our guards. So now our guard tests are all lifted up. We're in good shape. We're moving right along here. So we've written half a compiler. Uh, now, what's next? What are we going to do? We're going to update our counts. And the counts is, is uh, pretty trivial here. So it's, not, it's almost not even worth talking about. But, <laughs> but I will anyway. So we're going to take a histogram. We're basically going to take the counts of all the nodes that belong to certain types of nodes and compute the histogram of them. And the nodes that we care about are the nodes which, are, who's, which belong to expressions of subkind three. And that is, sorry, hang on, a little OCD moment here. <laughs> sorry? Yes. All right. Better. All right. So now let's lift up expressions. So how do we lift the expressions? Well, it's going to be similar to lifting the guards. We're going to have to flatten out, update our parents, push them all over the top. And that's going to be based off the parents. But instead of the parents of guards, we're going to have the parents of whatever our top level expressions are. So every expression will have a root that belongs to a function. So the function that has a set of expressions in it, the expressions start at some root expression node. That's what our x is going to be. And we compute that by walking up the tree from each node up to its expression, which is an expression. Who basically, we can tell that it's an expression because its parent is of type 3 or 4, which are the types of functions and guards. And then we compute this for all of our nodes that we care about. And the nodes that we care about are anything that might be our expression nodes. And we actually include guards in the set of expression nodes as well as a set of other expressions uh, in, in the set. Um, and this is a bit of a magic number here, but <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Actually, all right, we'll, we'll, I, I was not going to put in the comments, but I'll put in a comment for you. Just to clarify. Yeah, just to clarify. Uh, a, yeah. B, <laughs> e, F, G, F. Oh, so the Sputnik is a comment. And then <laughs> zero, one, two, three. <laughs> there are your node types oriented, associated with numbers. Uh, question, are you missing a right phrase at the beginning of the line? Where? Uh, here? Uh, or you mean here? Right? Yes, we're going to need a, a right closing brace on oh, this. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Somebody's paying attention, look at that. <laughs> oh my, what am I going to do? Uh, now, when we lift up expressions, we have to preserve the order of operations, right? So APL is evaluated right to left. So what does that mean? If all of our nodes are in depth first pre-order traversal, we flip them. So we're going to have to recompute a permutation vector that uh, basically 
reverses everything. There's our reverse symbol. All right, done. Now we've reversed. We've got a reversing permutation for our expression. So now all we have to do is reorder all of our nodes. So we do the P, T, K, and R, and we just reorder them. So we're going to basically take all of them and use J to reorder all of those nodes. So now we take every node with every column. We do the flip. We reorder everything. So now everything is put in the right dimension. All of them are flipped, but they're not flipped globally. They're flipped with respect to all of their ch um, siblings. So all of their siblings are flipped in the appropriate corresponding way. So now we have to recompute pointers again. Uh, so we're going to take P, which is the only pointer we really care about at this point, and do the IJ flip of that. And so all the J's are going to become the I's, and all the I's are going to become the J's. So we're good there. All right, so now we've flattened out all of our expressions. Oops. So now we need to compute the slots. So slot, we have a new field that we're going to introduce, S. And its base is going to be negative 1, but the result of all of this is basically going to be a set of 0 to, uh, zero to n intervals that we associate with the slot. So a slot gets 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, depending on how many variables are in a given frame. And we're going to base that on literally the, uh, the count of the frames. So we take the count of the frames, which is the first column of the environment, which is our lookup table, which is just the reordering and uniquing of all of the binding nodes, Rn, that appear in our node where binding nodes are of type 1. And that's our slots. And to compute the frames, we're going to take our data value and we're going to expand out that data value so, because we haven't really been expanding it right now. So we're going to expand it out so it's the same length as everything else. And then we're going to reinitialize all of the function level positions to 0 and then do a traversal up that computing a new depth vector for the function nodes based off of their nearest fun enclosing function. So this is calculating how far, how deeply nested a given function is. So if there are two, net, uh, two functions that enclose a function, its depth is going to be two, and so on and so forth. Based on i. Yes. Uh, oops. Et voila. Okay. And then our F field, so our frame, computing which frame you belong to, is just indexing the appropriate uh, E value uh, off of that new depth uh, connection. So now we have frames. Ah, I keep trying to save my work. Okay. When you see that, that I'm, I, I have an instinct to hit Alt <laughs> FS every time I type a line of APL. And so the problem is I keep doing that. And uh, it's, it's causing problems. So now the exports. So which variables are exported out of our system? Well, they are all of the variables who uh, basically the, they're names. So we need names that we're going to export. So the name of the exports are in the N field. And those are going to be any of the bindings that are uh, at the top level of the system. So there we go. <coughs> I did it again. OK. Now we can compute the final part, which is computing the lexical scope. So let's go ahead and do that. We just need to get all of the variable nodes, which are of type 10, and anything that hasn't been resolved already, which is going to be anything that's less than negative 4. And you may wonder, negative 4? Why negative 4? It's because there are four implicit arguments that are implicitly named inside of the system that we don't resolve. Yes, Obviously. That's what uh, and so then we're going to have a little temporary, which is going to store the names of the variables and the bindings. And actually, we're going to call the names of the variables and the bindings together y. And then we're going to 
figure out what the names of the bindings are. So we're going to convert the names of the bindings from names into their appropriate slot. So a binding no longer binds to a name, now it binds to a specific slot in the frame. And we do that by looking up its appropriate slot inside of the environment based on Rn. And then we need to compute, we're going to start by assuming, this is our assumption here, that all of our lookup variables are unbound. In other words, we haven't found anything yet. So we're going to start there. And then we're going to go through this process of a lookup. And we're going to try to look up all of the variables. And we're going to just basically do a little bit of an iteration by looking up all the variables in a specific frame. And then if we can't find them in that frame, we're going to bump up to the next parent frame and continue from there. Where we look up in the frame and we compute x at 1 of the r i at 0. And I really should find a bit. I've been trying to think of how I describe that thing. I don't have a good natural English language. It's kind of just there for me. So it's just like the whole thing says, uh, says with the current frame we're looking at for this current variable that's named something, find it in the environment and update our index. So that's, that's, that's the way I think of it. It's not perfect. Um, I would like to clean that up a little bit. And we're going to start by making sure that we search bindings one frame up so we don't find our own binding to look up our binding. And the reason we're looking at bindings and variables is because uh, if you have a free reference to the same variable that's bound inside of your function, you want to be able to access that variable in one frame up. So if you've got a, something that you've got, like in Python, if you do x equals x, that oftentimes that other x will just be ignored. In dfunds, that other x actually is a free reference out uh, before the binding. So we want to make sure we handle the bindings. And oh no, oh no. Yes, there we go. Don't forget the don't forget the other bar. Critical. Okay. And that'll look bad. I did it again. Wait, <laughs> wait. Okay. And now we're just gonna update this using our newly recomputed index value and make sure to store those in the y uh, in our y. So we're play, remember y is the locations of our variables and our bindings. And we're gonna start with negative one. Uh, which is how we're going to refer to things that are unbound or irrelevantly bound. And we're going to base that off of P or R, wherever. Okay, I did it again. Do not save. Big one. All right, so there's the compiler. All done. Yes. Now. Yes. So, so now we get to play. Now we get to have fun. So I've talked about this whole thing. You guys have patiently withstood this <laughs> onslaught of symbols and Unicode digraphs being sent your way. And so now it's free time. Uh, and if you guys don't have anything to do, we'll do more coding, because I've got some fun basic examples that we're going to see if we need to. But I want us to reflect on this and ponder what is actually occurring here, what isn't occurring here, what is missing, and what is there, and what are the properties of this thing? I think you had a question. Yes, I was curious how do you actually uh, get the ASD that you pass into this function to begin with? That's the parser. So I have another aspect of the compiler that's the parser, and it bring, parses the data in using parser combinators and spits it out to me. But we're not going to see that today. I will show that to you uh, later if we want to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, okay, fine. We'll do it. <laughs> we'll do it now. You twisted me arm. How do you know you didn't make one mistake in any of these lines? How do I know that I didn't make one mistake? Yeah, you didn't actually run the code. No, I didn't. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> no, it looks good. <laughs> what language does this compiler compile? APL. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's do, oh, all right, so everything with the underscore, that's my parser combinators, and then we have uh, terminals and then non-terminals. This is just a standard uh, peg parser grammar for parsing stuff, nothing particularly interesting. Okay. Uh, so that's two pages. Um, so it's actually about four times as large as this compiler. I haven't done as much optimization work on that, obviously. Uh, now, um, yeah, so 
So we don't have a lot of time left, but let's ponder what's here and what isn't here. What is missing from this program? No, 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 there's documentation right there. Right there. Right there. And on the top, I gave you two whole lines of documentation. Yes. That's 10% of the program. At <laughs> uh, what point are you actually going to run this? Well, uh, we can, I've got some code demos, like a camel case example. I can actually run this code uh, if you want to see it. But this compiler, would, it's, it's a compiler itself. It's not going to interpret the APL code. No, it's compiling the APL code into C++. And CUDA. <laughs> that was the obvious from here. Okay. No, because I didn't put the code generator. In. Okay. Right. Yeah. But let's let, let's focus on what's missing in this piece of code here. So when you write a compiler, what do you think? Data type abstraction. Uh, probably some helper functions. Uh, recursion. Pattern matching. Branching. Visitor pattern. If statements. Loops. Uh, any of those. None of that is here. There's no helper functions, especially no named helper functions. There's no if statements. There's no explicit <coughs> looping. There's nothing up there. All we have is function comp uh, composition, basically. Um, yeah, yeah, we have function composition, and that's what the compiler is made out of. Uh, so now it, I have to put a disclaimer on here, right? I'm going to make lots of bold statements that come off as prescriptivist, and it's prescriptivist because I'm in my world. <laughs> And I prefer it that way because it's a lot more interesting if you can make pres prescriptivist statements instead of descriptivist statements. Uh, additionally, not all APLers do it this way. I am pushing the extremes of what can be done with APL. That's why it's research. But uh, yeah. So uh, additionally, notice that we've done no data type abstraction in the <coughs> sense of what Haskellers would consider data type abstraction. right? But we get some benefits for this. Uh, we can calculate almost to the exact bit that how much our AST is going to use. So now think back to any tree that you've written in your program. Do you know exactly how many bytes it's using in the memory system? Let's think about asymptotic complexity. We can mechanically derive the asymptotic complexity of this program. Not just it's easy to figure out, but a computer could figure out the complexity of this program using basic uh, big O notation algebra without any difficulty whatsoever. In addition to that, uh, Snoyman in Functional Comp said about his slides, well, maintaining this code is pretty silly because it all fits on one slide. <laughs> so I would argue this is trivially maintainable code, according to Snoyman. <laughs> Not true, obviously, but it's fun to think about. Yes? Can you talk a bit about uh, how strongly this is coupled? Like, for example, if you, maybe you've already done this, I wouldn't know, but uh, if you want to thread something like errors uh, throughout this, uh, throughout what you've just written, like, how easy would it be to uh, say, oh, so the lowest level function yep. in here should actually refer like a pair of things? So, Two points on that. A, you're making a cardinal sin of writing good APL characters, thinking that you're going to thread silly engineering abstractions into the system and ruin everything. But uh, also, this code is designed to eliminate as much boilerplate as possible and to bring out the core ideas of a compiler as strongly as possible. And that means that every single change you make to the system is a system level, architectural level change. There's just no boilerplate left. Or, uh, there is. There's some boilerplate in here that irks me. Uh, and I'm working to get rid of it, but um, this is the best I've been able to do so far. And so, yes, uh, and actually that, I should show that before we run out of time. This is following a set of patterns. So Iverson's design principles for the way a good language should work follow these set of things. It should be ease of solution expression, it should have suggestivity, all these other things. But those are really, really abstract, and they don't really help a computer scientist in today's world because it doesn't explain why APL is so confusing to some people to look at. So what I did is I came up with eight patterns and anti-patterns of what good APL looks like versus what good mainstream programming looks like. And on the right, you'll recognize all of the good, warm, fuzzy things you've been taught to do throughout all of your programming time, right? Use good variable names, right? Write clear, verbose code. Uh, make sure that everything is, make sure your functions are readable. 
Uh, make use of abstractions and make sure you build up the right abstractions so you can use your system. You know, make sh leverage libraries so you can do stuff. Avoid code duplication. Use your control flow to communicate things through the program. Uh, you know, all this stuff. All of these things are things that if you do this in APL, you're making your APL code harder to work with, harder to read, worse. So instead, we do the other things. And I've given a talk on, on this before, so you can go see that talk if you want to see what, what it's all about. Uh, but basically, things like threading error conditions through might be a good idea sometimes, depending on the thing, but oftentimes it's completely unnecessary and undesirable, depending on where you're inserting those. If it's the end user that needs to deal with errors, okay, yeah, yeah. But if you're inside of your system and you need to deal with the errors, no, like, that's needless code load. Similar to why data type abstractions and static type systems are needless code flow. <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, so another question. Yeah, I think my question is always why don't more people program APL then? Because they're computer scientists. Uh, if you're not a computer scientist, there are a lot of people programming APL. That would be more of an evolutionary question. Yeah, so there were a few things that happened. One, in the 90s, OOP took over, we failed to capitalize on the microcomputer wave, we were all still on the mainframe, and we lost a ton of ground in that space. Two, uh, until parallel computing became really popular, the fact that this program uh, right here is data parallel by construction and is designed to self-host itself on a GPU, so all of this is data parallel, right? It's already parallel. You don't have to do anything to make this parallel and make it run on a GPU. Right? It's already been designed from the ground up to run on the GPU. Uh, that stuff wasn't as valuable back in the 90s, and so people didn't think about that kind of stuff. Additionally, how many of you think you could make, if somebody gave you this piece of code and said, here's what we want to make you to maintain, and you've never seen any APL code, but you're familiar with Haskell and Scheme and SML, you are a hardcore expert level programmer doing this stuff for 20 years, what would you say if you saw this? What I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah, and so the problem is, if, if you're not familiar with how this stuff works, it's very front heavy in terms of what you have to learn before you feel confident. So that most programming languages have an easy learning curve. APL starts with a heavy, scary wall that quickly tapers off. So you have to get over that initial hump before you can start doing things. Uh, or before you can start feeling confident. And it's the feelings that matter, unfortunately. If, if you haven't, I mean, just to say that, if, if there weren't PHP as a programming language, you know? Yeah. There wouldn't probably be any programmers around, right? Potentially. Well, well actually, no, I, I disagree with that. Okay. I disagree with that. We'll have to take that offline, but yeah. Um, but the, it also, the, the problem is people are not taught to do this kind of program, right? So you don't have anything to build yourself up on, right? Computer science still matters when you do this programming, but only after you've internalized a different way of thinking. You'll notice, when I thought about this stuff, I wasn't thinking about what the core APL operations were. I was thinking about what those core operations were mapped to in the domain that I was thinking of, the trees, right? But I didn't do that using abstraction. I did that by remapping my mind so that all of these symbols mean something different to me in this domain. So there's no abstraction here that's creating that domain thing. But this is, in an essence, my DSL for programming trees. It's just that I didn't have to do anything to get the DSL. Uh, yes? How do I start learning APL so I can... Uh, so my, my blog has a page. Uh, ta -da. And you can go there or you can go to dialogue.com and start there and you can start learning all of it. The, the thing is, remember, um, it's very easy for you to get discouraged at the beginning because you're dealing with something that's very foreign. So a lot of my talks, if you read, if you watch a lot of my talks, I'm talking about how we get over that hump after the line. You can learn the basics of APL in four hours and be totally familiar with the language. But using it then requires that you get good with actually using the language. And that requires writing some code and playing with stuff. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we don't have that much time here. So I'm also going to say, feel free to get in touch with me the rest of the day and call me out we, if there's a talk or anything. We can sit out there and chat about any of your questions you have. Yeah. Uh, question. So, um, would, would you say that um, it's useful to learn the language to, to, to learn ideas that one can apply in another language? Or, are you, or is it is the notation, um, this very concise notation, uh, a 
Um, that's an excellent, insightful question. And I would have to say, unfortunately, in my experience, a significant reason APL is so good at doing what it is is because of the syntax. And a lot of people try to get APL-like features into other languages, but because they don't understand that it's syntax and the experience and the total package of what makes this work, is they'll get some of the advantages, but they won't ever actually get the, the mythical advantages, if you will. The things that the APLers rave about happen because we're looking at this as a math notation rather than another programming language. And if you don't do that, uh, it, it's, I've never seen anyone get a successful APL in another language. I think it would be a really cool result if you did. The problem is mo it just doesn't exist because what makes APL unique is this combination, this holistic combination of features and ideas that allow you to engage with your problems in a way that's different than the way other programming languages encourage you to engage with your ideas. And that's not just semantics. That's not just I'm using arrays. It's a fundamental different workflow that you're working with. Yes? You said you're doing research on this. Uh, what are kind of the, uh, apart from actually being useful and then uh, uh, having this new way of thinking about things, like what are the research directions that you're looking at? So for one, uh, it's new, the fact that we can do tree manipulation using canonical APL is a, a novel result in and of itself. The fact that we now have a method for doing parallel tree manipulation on the GPU with a co source code that ends up being smaller than the reference code in a serialized traditional computer language is a novel interesting result. Um, the HCI research into what makes APL uniquely APL is novel in the HCI community, you say. Um, and then I'm going from there. I'm very interested in education and things like that. Yeah. Um, are there any, any programs with an APL or software solutions in APL around? Or Sorry, uh, could you repeat that? Are there any, any actual problem solutions around that are with an APL, or is this just more like an academic endeavor in doing APL stuff? No, the academics hate APL because <laughs> it's hard to publish papers around it. But uh, there's lots and lots of industrial use, a lot of it behind NDAs. So, um, but insurance, finance, medical records, uh, physics, simulations, oil, um, cars. Okay, that's kind of an open follow-up to this question. Um, are those mostly legacy solutions, like uh, many of the solutions within the banking sector, and something like Provo, or is it uh, like actually? Stuff. They're currently being developed, actively refined, added to new feature set, but a lot of them are very, very old. Yeah. Um, but uh, there is new development happening as well. The, the difference is that a lot of people don't do new development because they don't even know APL is still a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, yes? Do you have any advice on the determining if the initial cost of entry is worth it for someone? I'm biased there, you know. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, I think it fundamentally is worth it, but uh, it does depend a lot on how suitable like dialog APL would be to solving your actual problems. If it's anything to do with computation, data analytics, anything like that, uh, the investment can be really, really valuable. The problem is you have to be willing to actually spend some time seriously considering it. You can't just, oh, we're just going to do the same thing we did in a new language. This is a fund it's like switching from waterfall to agile. This is a fundamentally different way to engage with software. Um, and it's, it's yeah, uh, so it's worth it. How worth it depends on your exact program space. Um, I've never found a space where it wouldn't theoretically be worth it if people uh, felt that it was, uh, there's one space where it's not, and that is where you're so close to the margins on profitability that you can't afford to learn or change anything. Uh, but if you're in any space that's growing that you need to be able to move things forward and improve things, then I generally think it's, pretty well worth it. Um, but of course, I'm a biased guy. Yeah. I, I think we had some back here before. Uh, yeah. We're uh, running out of time. Are you able to compare and contrast APL with uh, other languages like J and K? And uh, J was a stopgap measure that Iverson used because people were too afraid of the symbols. We have Unicode now. Nobody should be afraid of the symbols anymore. K is Arthur Whitney's take on uh, array languages that is a highly tuned, highly optimized thing for a very specific space. Uh, APL is a much more general purpose tool. Last one? Um, oh, we've got two. Uh, I think oh, you had, had your, your, yeah, I think you had your hand up there. So, uh, 
I always saw APL as a array oriented programming language with quite a syntax. But yeah. Array oriented programming is very popular. Or yeah, yeah. sci fi and all these things used inside the different community. Yeah. So I wonder what is missing from the, what is the part that makes APL different from those languages? In the experience, the, the language, the culture, the syntax, the, the, the set of symbol primitives are... are How does it make you more effective? Or what's the part that I, I'll have to take that offline. Yeah. I can, I, we, should, we can do a little mini session out here at the SELFAs and discuss that one question, because that's a, that's a critical question. I've got some other talks on that, too. I also included the uh, uh, camel case benchmark. I, I, I open challenge to anybody if they can come up with faster benchmarks for camel case. And this is, uh, this is the interpreter. And this is uh, two versions of camel casing in the interpreter and then with a compiler running on the GPU. And the code is um, uh, this function here. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that's a fun little problem. If you guys want to write your own camel case in your own fun, um, favorite program and see how it performs or see how it looks compared to this, something like this. Um, yeah. So anyways, uh, I think he's going to kick me out now. <laughs> Sorry? You get extra two minutes of my time. Okay. Okay, we have permission. All right, all right, yes. Is dialogue in Kelly set up for commercial products? Uh yes, but they're very open source friendly if you want to say. Yeah. Um, my compiler is AGPL dual licensed with a commercial license option. You mentioned that uh, you issue control structures for something like data flow in a sense. Yes. Uh, are there um, ways of bringing APLs more of a distributed cluster like setting for bigger uh, yes. Uh, in addition to GPU dispatch, um, we, you get what are called isolates in a dialog APL, which allows you to spawn uh, a number of APL sessions on remote machines and then do parallel um, dispatch across all the machines. And then we have a more or less plug and play system for microservices and um, uh, like lightweight in the cloud microservices based off of stuff like that. So you can just put it all together. And then we've got a web server and all that other things. The camel case benchmarks, here are four different ways of doing camel case in APL, um, which we benchmarked and played with at the last conference that I attended. And we, um, I guess I should show you what it does. Uh, so if we have something like this, and we do camel set on it, it camel cases it. And we're really, really fast at that. So a 32 megabyte camel case gets done in the interpreter with the slow stuff in like, what, what is that? I hate my e notation. Uh, 59 milliseconds, I think. Yeah, 59 milliseconds. And then in, in the, uh, the GPU, it's even faster. And then if you get up to a gigabyte, that slower one actually turns out to be faster. Uh, but, uh, yeah. uh, any other questions? or? That was two minutes, though. Yeah, yeah, that was two minutes. I don't, I, I, we've got more interesting stuff to come from other speakers, so yeah. I'm happy to take other stuff offline in the breaks or at night or in between. <laughs> I'll hang out in the outside and we can talk as long as you want, because uh, I know there's a lot to talk about, but yeah. So, okay, thanks.